ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you're entitled to call me a colleague. I was a film critic many years ago. Indeed, I was a film critic on the oldest European newspaper, the Gibraltar Chronicle, which in uh, 1943-44, when I worked for it, was the only non-fascist newspaper in continental Europe, even though it was run by the British Army. Uh, we soldiers in this fortress had been informed through Washington, through your great dead president, President Roosevelt, that we had a duty to perform, and that was to protect the rock on behalf of a very large American assurance company. <laughs> we were told that if we let this rock fall into fascist hands, the future of American civilization would be in jeopardy. And as an earnest of this American civilization that was in jeopardy, we were allowed to see many American bee films. <laughs> It was, my, it was my task to uh, criticise these films, appraise them. I was rather bored with the job and uh, went to very few of them and ended up by inventing my own films in my own cinemas. The Rock is a very cavernous place and uh, there may be the odd cinema lurking somewhere in St Michael's Cave in the water that nobody actually had been to but thought they might someday. Anyway, I was fired from this job and uh, never did film criticism again. In 1966 which was my annus mirabilis, for the benefit of any drama critics who may be present, a uh, wonderful year. Uh, I had many jobs. I, I was drama critic for The Spectator, and simultaneously I was, uh, I was opera critic for Queen, great, great heterosexual magazine. <laughs> I was television critic for a magazine ironically called The Listener. <laughs> and I was a food and wine critic for a left-wing paper that eventually folded up. It was generally recognised that I couldn't do all these jobs efficiently at the same time. And uh, I noticed one night in a particular theatre during the first act, there were other critics who had been deputed by their newspapers to sit behind me and see if I genuinely walked out after the first act. <laughs> my normal procedure was to see one act of a play, the second act of an opera, and have some food and wine afterwards. <laughs> assumed by everybody that I would never get up early enough to see films, so I never became a film critic. <laughs> now, as for my connection with the cinema, this is uh, equally tenuous. My, my father was um, a cinema pianist. <laughs> he played in those days which most of you are too young to remember, when there was no sound soundtrack and the accompaniment had to be provided by an orchestra in the evenings and by a pianist during the day for matinees. My father never saw any films before he accompanied them. He did all by ear, memory, instinct, intuition, and he had a very much foreshortened view of the pictures of the company. <laughs> Tell me on one occasion that he worked in a cinema for six months with a piano that didn't work above middle C. <laughs> so all the music was somewhat Wagnerian. <laughs> He was fired from this job because, without his knowing it, the film he was looking up at one afternoon, foreshortened, was a religious film, and he saw what looked like a scene of great festivity among men proceeding, and he started playing Hail, Hail, the gang's all here. <laughs> and this turned out, of course, to be the last supper. Supper. <laughs> I'm sorry I've been allowed a blasphemous note to intrude, but this is, after all, a New York Sunday. <laughs> if, I, if I continue just for a second with a blasphemy, I suppose my, my own relationship with uh, this film is that of primal creator with uh, ultimate interpreter, uh, which finds its most megalomaniacal, if I can use the term, or uh, most mythical metaphor in, say, the relationship between God and Cecil B. DeMille, <laughs> or it may be the other way round. 
God wrote a marvellous book, a bestseller, a marvellous title called The Old Testament. I don't think he's ever received a penny in royalties for it. But God is a spirit, and I'm merely a consumer of spirits. And my case with regard to this masterpiece, which I think will make a lot of money, is somewhat different. As far as Kubit's concerned, I knew little about him. Uh, I was told over the telephone <laughs> that uh, Stanley Kubrick wished to make my book A Clockwork Orange into a film and I would get no money from it. Well, I said, no, I know this already. You didn't tell me. <laughs> but he said, um, would you rather he made it and get no money or somebody else make it? Well, I had a, a, a vision of Ken Russell making it. <laughs> So I said I was prepared to pay Krubik to make the film. <laughs> Turned out to my surprise that Kubrick did not actually need the money at the time. Uh, Kubrick uh, reappeared in my life, or very nearly. Uh, he hadn't really appeared at all, had he? Appeared, he reappeared by name very nearly when I was uh, in Australia and uh, I was summoned to London to see Kubrick because of two lines in the book. He wasn't sure whether he was a copyright or not, or whether they were quotations from an existing song, whether I'd actually written them. So I rushed from Australia to New Zealand, to Hawaii, San Francisco, New York, and eventually landed up in London and uh, appeared for lunch at that old English tavern called Trader Vicks. <laughs> After a couple of old English noggins <laughs> of my tie, uh, Kubrick did not turn up. <laughs> then Kubrick, to use the Australian vernacular, nearly gave birth to a set of diesel engines <laughs> when, he, uh, when he discovered that the British edition of the book was different from the American edition. Indeed, the American edition, if anybody's interested, has 20 chapters, whereas the British edition has 21. Uh, there's a cartoon in uh, the British Daily Express which shows a man and a woman leaving the cinema, having seen Kubrick's film, saying, George, dear, I do hope they don't make son of Clockwork Orange. <laughs> well, this is no joke because uh, chapter 21 in the British edition is precisely that. It's uh, the count of the son of Clockwork Orange, and anybody who wishes to make this movie as a follow-up is welcome to see me afterwards. <laughs> Well, but, uh, as you know, uh, he doesn't travel. God, I mean, Kubrick doesn't travel. <laughs> and uh, he is stuck there in Boreham Wood, about two miles from Pinewood Studios outside London. And if I may use again a dramatic allusion, uh, there's no question of Boreham Wood coming to dance in aim, dances here. <laughs> So all I can say now is that uh, I know your little droogy, your little malinky droogy back there in Boreham Wood will smack down to his very kishkas or even his yardles when I place this horror show for Darok into his rookers. <laughs> On his behalf, on his behalf, ladies and gentlemen, I say thank you for your generosity. On his and my behalf, I say thank you for your perspicacity. And on my own behalf, my fellow writers, I say thank you for your hospitality. Thank you.